So welcome to our kind of first official event of Alumni Weekend and Board Trustee Mark Dave, who is here to um, introduce his renowned comic collection. He gave this presentation to Yale Law School as well, and there's a really amazing um, article written in the New York Times, which um, some of you might have gotten my email today. Um, also, if you want to see his display of comic books, they are in the library in the display cases, so you should definitely go check them out. Um, and Mark, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Jordan. Okay. Harold, thanks everybody for coming. <laughs> it's, it's fun to be back, 25th year of reunion, it's hard to believe. I'm, I'm back every year anyway, so it doesn't really seem like 25. But I'm going to go through this. Uh, with you guys for the next hour or so. If we have time, I have a sort of supplemental presentation I can try and run through real quickly, and I will make sure we're going to go get the free alcohol and food <laughs> in the courtyard by 5.30, absolutely, so no worries about that. So I, I've been collecting comics for, for over 40 years, so when I was just a little kid down in Long Island, and became a comic book dealer actually in high school. and. Uh, took a break in college and did a little bit when I was here at Albany Law uh, for one year. I did a show here in, in downtown at some point. And then was out of it for a while as I got my law practice going on. Uh, this is my law practice. I, I deal with spies. I represent folks who work at the CIA, the NSA, the FBI. Uh, I'm basically an employment lawyer for spies. So I'm James Bond's lawyer. Uh, Mulder and Scully from X-Files, etc. Uh, and so this has been awesome where I can combine the two passions of what I do as a lawyer and what I do as a part-time comic book dealer, which I got back into about a little over a dozen years ago to basically, as I finally made some money in law practice, I could fuel my hobby and actually buy the books that I wanted to. And I became very interested and involved on sort of a the political level of comic books in the community, so I advised the comic book price guide. I, I actually, as a lawyer, represent comic book dealers and uh, companies that grade comic books, which I'll, I'll show you some examples of. Uh, so whenever they get in trouble, because I can be an expert witness as much as I can as a lawyer. So what I'm going to first do is just give you a, a quick introduction to the hobby of comics, as we then get into the legal aspects of it. <clears throat> so. This was a Swiss comic that came into the United States uh, a couple of years after it had been published over in Europe in French. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily what we look at today, obviously, as comic books, from what we understand them to be, but uh, like, and some people don't think it's a comic book because of this notion, but like everything, it's, it's all about evolution. So that's, that is the comic book ancestor of what we have in, in modern times today. And some examples throughout the 19th century, these really are what we would have. And it's, they're political cartoons. The brownies are actually quite fascinating. Palmer Cox, uh, somebody needs to do a biography of this gentleman. The brownies think like Smurfs from the 19th century, and this man created merchandising. Like everything we know about it today came from Palmer Cox. Back in the late 19th century, early, very early 20th century, the brownies were everywhere. And since there wasn't anything with respect to political correctness or where not to promote children's items, they were on tobacco tins, they were involved with any type of food items, and, and they would just be everywhere. And they pretty much disappear for whatever reason. They're storybooks. They're not really, again, what we understand comic books to be today. Then the Yellow Kid, which came out a little over a century ago, in 20 years or so, uh, was a newspaper comic strip called The Yellow Kid because he was yellow, uh, and which was unique at that time because newspaper. this was in, as I said, newspapers. So it was all black and white. And when he came out in color, that was the new, uh, really, the new way to go. I, I always find fascinating, especially when I, I collect a lot of the comics from the, the 20s and the 1930s. Just about everything in this presentation is part of my own collection. And 
humor translates really differently. So when you read some of these, which were comic book strips, which again were some of the top strips of the day, I read it, I don't have a clue what they're talking about. The humor is completely lost. Uh, versus physical humor, if you watch the Three Stooges now, still Laurel and Hardy or the Abbott and Costello from the 30s and 40s, 50s, still for the most part pretty funny, I think. At least I always thought so. But you read some of these, and it's, they're really geared towards whatever was the topic of the day. Uh, so I collect them. They're hard to find, uh, but they, they really don't translate well. We started to come a little bit more into modern day in the 20s. Uh, still, again, comic book strips, but now it's being issued monthly. It's got a price on it. And then the first modern comic in 1933. All newspaper strips, they literally took the newspaper and folded it over and decided to issue it out. 10,000 Comics, this was a promotional book. As it says, Procter & Gamble, same company that we have today. Max Gaines went on uh, you may recognize that name, went on to found Mad Comics in the 1950s. We're going to get back to him because his son plays a major role. But this was the first time Max was the one who was going around uh, to try and sell products for Easton Publishing Company, Easton Color Printing Company. And once he realized how well this did, he came up with a new idea. He was like, you know what, let me see if I can make some money on it. So he took a bunch of these, which was the second comic book, again all prints from the newspaper, put a 10 cent sticker on it, gave it to some newspaper stand dealers in New York City, came on a Friday, came back on a Monday, and they were all gone. So he realized, you know what, I'm on to something here that we can actually make some money. So uh, by that time, DC Comics was founded in 1935. Uh, Superman didn't come out until 1938, so we didn't really see in the much of of superheroes for a couple of years. But we as lawyers, the law, courts, judges, have been involved in this hobby since day one, not surprisingly, both from what we do behind the scenes, but also as we'll see actually in the scenes. So these are what are called Ashcan comics. Uh, I have one on display downstairs in the library. This was designed to secure the trademark of the logo. Frankly, we don't know much about them. I wrote an article for the Comic Book Price Guide about mm, seven, eight years ago. Much of the history is lost. I mean, everyone who was involved with this back in the late 30s, early 40s, obviously all dead. Uh, and having worked with DC Comics on a number of projects, they have no history of a lot of these items. They have actually no clue. In fact, some of these uh, were, were their copies that were literally stolen from their archives and entered onto the, onto the market and I ended up buying them. They know I have them. They have never asked for, to have them back. Their lawyers are friends of mine, so I'm okay with it. Uh, that they, they're not going to ask me back for it. Uh, then nobody thought of them as having any type of value. Some of them have some real significant value, quite frankly. But this here is an example of what race was going on in 1939. The two on the left are, are by Fawcett Comics, Fawcett Publishing. Fawcett was a major educational publishing house uh, that had lots of educational books, school books, uh, into the 1980s until uh, Random House bought it out. On the right is Flash from DC Comics. So what they would do for Ashcans is, uh, and by the way, DC won the battle on this of getting to the trademark office first. So if you look at how the logo is, right, same logo for it. We don't know why Fawcett put in two different versions of it. Now for DC, they would usually put a book inside of the ash can. And frankly, they didn't even need to have uh, anything other than the logo. And, and also the trademark office has nothing in its files. They told me they purged their files decades ago, so we, don't even, we can't even trace anything through that. DC would put information into the interior, usually what would be called it a remainder copy. They take a published book, part of it, and stick it inside the middle, and then send it to the trademark office. Fawcett would just usually just do the cover logo, or perhaps 
they would put some text on the inside. But none of it was relevant, because it really didn't make a difference since they're just trying to secure the logo title for it. So as it says, this artwork was never used uh, for anything. But Action Comics being where Superman first appeared in 1938. Uh, and when they realized they had a hit, DC tried to or did trademark anything that had the word action in it. So there's also a double action ash can that I own, which nobody knew about for decades. We heard rumors of it, uh, and I finally bought it. And for the first time, it was uh, up for auction. Uh, these were, they used to be, in fact, the guy who was the producer of the first Batman movie in 1989, Michael Usland, is a lawyer. And now he's a big Hollywood guy. But he had a legal internship with DC Comics in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, when he was a young guy. And he remembers inventorying these ash cans in the closet. And then at some point in time, I, by the 1980s, they disappeared. We think one of their editors who had been there since the 30s retired. And it looks like he took most of these with him, because that's where we got some of them. Apparently, this copy that I own was given as a present uh, to a young grad student who had written an article in the 50s that was defending comic books when they were going through a real tough time uh, before Congress and the public about what their contents were. And we're going to talk about it. And they gave this to him as a gift, and then somehow it ended up in into the public domain. So as it says, this one it had Detective 10, which had been published as part of it, uh, on the interior. And this ended up being used in a different uh, title. In fact, this is where it ended up being used in Action 3, a, few, a little bit later. Uh, and each of the titles were secured. So Superman, this is the ash can for Superman. So Superman came out in 1939 a year after Action Comics came out. And that cover ended up being the second appearance of Superman in Action 7. And Action, this comic now will sell for in the mid six figures, low to mid six figures, if anyone's even lucky to have a copy. <clears throat> and one of the things we don't know is there were a lot of comic book companies back in this day, in the 30s and 40s, but only a few apparently submitted trademark applications. DC and Fawcett were the big ones. There's a few others that we have proof that they did this, but for the most part, it was just these two major companies. Timely, which is now Marvel Comics, so they had Captain America, Submariner, some major characters, Human Torch, that exist into the modern era. No, no indication that they did anything like this with ash cans. But if you go downstairs in the library, I don't have it in this presentation. There's a trademark application, the actual application that I have that I bought through auction for uh, Young Allies, which was a title that had all these young superheroes like uh, Human Torch and uh, Bucky, who was Captain America's sidekick, which now we know in the modern films. So Although the Bucky in the modern films is not really what the comic books were dealing with in the 40s. But so they would create these. Now these had nothing on the interior. And most ash cans only had about three to 10 copies, right? So they would keep one copy in their own files. They'd send a copy down to the trademark office. Sometimes we have proof, at least, that they would take one copy and mail it to someone out of state. So DC was based in New York City at the time. Now they've moved out. They were bought by Warner Brothers in the late 60s. Now they moved out to Los Angeles. They may still have a, DC pre a New York presence, but they're mostly in LA now. So they'd mail a copy out of state, and then have that person mail it back. And we know that only because I have a letter of DC sending it to someone in Jersey saying, Here, here's this comic. Uh, please mail it back to us. Anybody know why they were doing that? Shout it out. Anybody have any idea? Date stamp. I took copyright when I was here. I forget who taught it. but Stamp on the date. No. There was a, I, I, this is not my area of expertise. I can tell you about spies, so uh, I'm just telling you what I remember. Uh, they would do it so that they would show it was in the stream of commerce and have protection from a trademark standpoint. That, they, there was a lot of confusion back in the days. What did they need to do to protect the titles? Because the, by this time, we're talking big money. The first few years of comic books, we're not talking about a lot of money, and a lot of these comic book companies are going out of business. 
by the time Superman came about, and as we'll see, Captain Marvel came about, now we're start talking about a lot of money. So to have a particular title or logo, you know, would, would really make a difference. And so it wouldn't just be anything now. You might have recognized some of these other titles. But so DC would take art and just submit it for any type of possible title that they would want to consider using for a comic book. And in fact, none of these were ever published as a title uh, at all. And it's the same art, as you can see, from what was Boy Commandos, number one, that did come out. So they, and again, the art had nothing to do with it. And there's some record, at least, well, I guess it's lore more than anything else, uh, that said someone had a uh, discussion with the trademark office who finally told them, why, why do you keep sending us all of this? You just need to send us the logo. So if you look at the trademark application I have in the library, if you, you can kind of see behind the front cover, there is just the logo, just it's the application and the logo that they sent in rather than, than doing all of this. And this was the ad can for Boy Commanders. I, I don't know where, if this art was ever used in everything. So another one for Strange Adventures. Now Strange Adventures came out in the 1950s as a title, for, published for many years. It was a science fiction title, but the art they used was Western for whatever reason again. And ironically, and it worked out well for me, the interior is Detective 140, which is the first appearance of Riddler, which is actually probably worth more than the Strange Adventures Ashcan comic that I have, which was like $1,000. But the Detective 140 Riddler, uh, obviously, is a significant character. Now, so it wasn't just trademark. It was also copyright. So now the difference being the Copyright Office at the Library of Congress would be sent the actual published book. And then they would stamp it. If you look on each of them, you'll see uh, a little bit different, a couple of them have a little bit different stamps that the Library of Congress uh, stamped, indicating when they received the book. And on some of these, you will see a check mark. I think the clown one has it. That one is actually downstairs in the library. Uh, and I think the storybook has it. The check mark is indicating that at some point in time, the library transitioned these books out. In the 80s, they, they purged a lot of their paper collections. It was taking up too much room, and they decided they're going to sell a lot of it. If it doesn't have that, then probably somebody stole it from the Library of Congress, and it worked its way through into the, to the marketplace. Library of Congress also knows I, has the, I have these. I told them. They asked me to donate them back. I said, I'll think about it. Uh, give me time. I want to enjoy them first. And they now have, they recollect comic books. So they, they, they really regret that they got rid of a lot of their stuff back in the day. And now they have a very large collection. In fact, you can make an appointment to go see some of them. They just had a great exhibit. And they have the original art from Amazing Fantasy 15, which is the first appearance of Spider-Man. It's, it's worth over a million dollars. Easy. Uh, and they will they will show it to you on display. Now, you know, lawyers, we are there in all throughout history, right? And certainly in literature, Shakespeare kill all the lawyers in the what sixteenth century, I guess that was for Shakespeare. Uh, which, you know, if anyone ever says that to you, which you know we'll always see on Twitter or Facebook, someone will use it in a condescending way to kill all the lawyers, whereas actually if if you know the, the story that that really applies to, it's a positive thing about lawyers. It was the bad guy in the story saying he wants to kill all the lawyers because the lawyers were stopping him from doing the, whatever bad things he was doing. We were the good guys <laughs> in the story. But no one pays attention to that, so we always hear about negative things about, yeah, let's kill all the lawyers. Well, from the beginning of comic books, we were in comic books, not only with obviously making sure that, that the books can be published and the titles can be used, but the storyline consistently. And understand, until really for any of us, for, for anything that those of us in this room <coughs> experienced, comic books were very different back then from now. Uh, up until, I would say, the 80s, comic books were written for kids, anywhere about 8 to 15 years old. 
nowadays comic books are written for adults. I think stats I've seen, the average age of a reader is like 27 years old. Uh, they're obviously much more graphic, they're much more sexual, the, the content you know, is, is very explicit. Uh, these were for kids. Uh, so we see lawyers throughout the history, starting at least in 1936, remember 1933, the first modern comic book. Uh, 1935, the first comic book that had new material in, not surprisingly, called New Fun Comics, which was the first comic book published by DC, where they, they took new material rather than just the comic book strips. So we were there as sort of a superhero before Superman even existed. And there were female attorneys too, not as many. We'll, we'll see another one. I don't, I can't tell you much, if anything, unfortunately, about Betty Bates. Uh, this, this was not a title that survived for very, hit comics, actually it was around for a while. I'm not sure how much Betty Bates was there, but, but she was there. And of course we are villains too. Uh, Two-Face you may know from Tommy Jones' portrayal in the Batman movie. So Two-Face was a district attorney and he was prosecuting and the person, the, the bad guy threw acid in his face and turned one side uh, scarred, the other side still normal and you know, he, went, he went crazy as well. Uh, and that character is still around. Uh, we have been some other attorney villains. So the Golden Age Flash, so understand we had the Golden Age of Comics which went from 1938 to 1955. And then the Silver Age went from about 56 to early 70s, 73 or so. So the Golden Age comic books have different characters. So there's a Golden Age Flash, there is a Silver Age modern day Flash. There's a Golden Age Batman, a Silver Age Batman. Same thing with Superman. DC took, and this is the way DC structured it, uh, you can get different uh, storylines where the Golden Age, they're on Earth 1, and the Silver Age guys are on Earth 2, and we live on Earth Prime. We don't have superheroes. We read about them in comic books. And there's some really cool stories where the Earth 1 heroes and the Earth 2 heroes get together, and then one, a couple of times where Earth Prime people come onto the superheroes and interact. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, but for where, I guess attorney villains weren't very popular because we disappeared for 26 years until the next attorney bill. And much in the, the history of comics in the 40s and 50s, when radio was still the ultimate entertainment, so a lot of these came from radio stories that they then transitioned into comics. So the kids would be listening, you know, Sunday nights to, with their parents to radio, and then they get to read about it uh, in the comic books later on. And so I do a lot with polygraphs, so anytime I see a cover that has a polygraph machine in it, I always, I always need to get that. Uh, and, you know, he, he wasn't really a superhero. He was doing what district attorneys do, and they're obviously mostly criminal stories. And I tell you, you know, I've had some really cool clients over the years. I represent a lot of mainstream media, USA Today, Politico, Daily Beast. I, I handled Princess Diana's. Uh, case for the father of Dodi Fayed, who was uh, uh, with the princess when she died in 1997. I've litigated, especially those who were my classmates, the Kennedy assassination, the Lincoln assassination, but I have never defended the monkey man. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has knows who the monkey man is. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times these covers are a lot more interesting than I think the story was. Because uh, if I remember having read the story, there wasn't like anything really about this guy's face. He didn't look like a monkey. He was just hiding his identity, and, and I don't remember why he was called Monkey Man, quite frankly. But, uh, it, was, it was a key issue. So. Two-Gun Kid, who actually was around for at least 20 plus years, as I recall, is actually a lawyer. Uh, I, when, I, when I gave this lecture at Yale Law School, I had to hide the fact that he had gone to Harvard Law School, which they thought was pretty funny. I said, you know, he went to this other law school and just in Boston, but since for us in Albany, I, I just added in Harvard. I don't think we really care as much that we're concerned about Harvard Law School. Uh, but hey, you know, first comic book attorney to actually go to attend law school, a real law school. And 
sometime there was a rumor uh, that Batman had gone to law school and had gone to Yale, which Yale was very excited about when I gave my presentation. There, there's no evidence that he did, because he's never really practiced as a lawyer, though we'll have a little bit to see about that. We think, and his father was a doctor, but we're thinking maybe probably one of the people who was what, an artist on the Batman character at one point just put a Yale Law School diploma on the wall in Bruce Wayne's manner. Uh, maybe his parents went, I don't know. But one of the most famous lawyer comic book superheroes, of course, is Daredevil, who, after he lost his sight as a young kid, went on to become a lawyer. Uh, and so there's a number of issues. I got the New York Times, if, if you guys have seen the story, or if you go and look up the article that the New York Times did about my exhibit at Yale, the guy who wrote it's a comic book collector. And he gave me crap in the article, with the, you gotta love being called out in the New York Times, that I did not have on display a Daredevil comic book, given that he's the lawyer. Well, because there's like no covers where there's anything in it about the law other than this, which is obviously just the scales of justice, which you know, could be law, could, you know, maybe not. Uh, there was only, there's some internal discussions, but I, I didn't want to do in, in, internal panels, interior panels. I wanted to have the covers. Now, if you read this text here, I don't know about you guys, but I, I generally try not to bluff the court <laughs> when I'm before a district judge. Uh, apparently, Daredevil and Matt Murdock thought he could do that and get away with it. And and for those who saw one of the worst uh, <laughs> movies of superheroes, uh, was this one about 15 years ago. Now, if you do like the character, Netflix uh, has still going a Daredevil series that should be now, I think, its third season. And the first two seasons are very good. It's, it's really worth watching. And there's a lot of legal scenes uh, in it. And the guy who plays the Kingpin, also has his legal connections because it's the detective from Law and Order Criminal Intent uh, as well. So they just they, everybody just kind of shifts over. The Hulk has been prosecuted a bunch of times, represented by Matt Murdock, Daredevil, in fact. And to get back to a female lawyer, his cousin, the She-Hulk, is a lawyer. So. The, the character for She-Hulk is Bruce, is Bruce Banner's cousin, and she was a lawyer, and she got shot by some criminals, I think organized crime, if I remember, and Bruce Banner gave her a blood transfusion, and as a result, she became the She-Hulk. Now, unlike the Hulk, if you remember, the Hulk, when Bruce Banner becomes the Hulk, he usually loses his scientific mind, and he's just this, you know, crash, smash him up. God, uh, Jenny, if I remember her character's name, uh, maintains her intelligence, so she can still be a lawyer as her she-hulk persona. And here she is working with Matt Murdock uh, as well. No, and she looks pretty good. That's, that's a nice outfit. I'm not sure if that's in like New York Supreme Court or something. Uh, another character that came out in the 80s that was really good was Vigilante, who, uh, whose family was murdered and he became a vigilante and at night he would be a judge during the day and at night he would execute all the criminals. <laughs> so, that, that lasted about 20 or 30 issues as I recall. But actually it's a pretty good title. And then, you know, un as well as the characters being lawyers, DC in particular for some reason loved lawyers. I don't know why. There are very few comic book covers from Marvel in the 60s uh, when Marvel became its company transitioning from timely comics where there are any lawyers on the cover. But Superman has been prosecuted a ton of times uh, for some reason by just about everywhere he goes. And what would often happen as well is storylines, sort of like ripped from the headlines, Law and Order, that would happen in comic books as well. So here in 1964, Superman was on trial for murdering Lex Luthor. 
and he was appointed defense counsel. And I don't think it's any shock that Gideon B. Wainwright had come out the year, just a few months earlier, and obviously would have made the news so that they thought Superman should also get appointed defense counsel. And he didn't have any money to hire defense counsel because he has no pockets. So when he was on the other world, he had no credit cards or cash with him, which is why he needed to have a defense counsel appointed to him. And not to be outdone, Batman has been in court uh, any number of times as well. Uh, usually unfairly, since the Joker has the jury fixed uh, against him. And of course, in the heyday of the 1950s, crime was crime, and then westerns were, were really what everyone's reading. Superheroes fell out of fashion. And so there's a lot of crime comics in the late 40s, starting in about 1948 to about 1955, until the public uproar arose about, is this, is this good for kids to be reading about all of these things? Uh, as the same thing with romance. And of course, you've got to have divorce courts and all sorts of uh, situations that would be involved with lawyers and temptresses and everything. Uh, and no surprise, horror also made its way. This is in the early 70s, 73, 74, give or take. And again, late 60s, in mid to late 60s in particular, television shows really made their way into comics. Uh, Dell in particular, most of the comic, most of the television shows that we enjoyed either watching in the 60s or in reruns in the 70s ended up becoming comic books as well. So the gentleman on the left may look familiar. Anybody know who he is? Robert Reed from the Brady Bunch, the oh, dad in the Brady yeah. Bunch. So this was, he was in a short-lived show for about a year or so uh, as lawyers in the late 60s. And I don't think many people realize that Gomez Adams from the Adams family is a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> So, the comic book, there was no discussion of it at all, but hey, he, he was a lawyer. Now, we also go, of course, with respect to lawsuits. So, anytime something starts to make some money, there's going to be a lot of litigation arising. Most of these are copyright lawsuits, but they get into the heart of what was going on in the publishers' minds as they started to create. Now, Buster Brown was a very popular comic book strip and large comic books for kids, not again in the way we know them to be, be like literally like large books like this big, uh, with very little text with him and his dog. Uh, most of us probably know Buster Brown from the shoes that we bought, in, especially in the early 70s. That was licensed from, uh, from the company, uh, even though the character itself is pretty much disappeared. But any time these characters came out, obviously tons of people would try to copy them. Not just in comic strips, but in any type of merchandising and artwork and dolls. So again, we don't really know Barney Google today, uh, though this was a stamp that came out what, in the mid-80s, 85 I think it says. Uh, but in the late mm, teens and 20s, these were massive characters that were the hit of childhood. Uh, and a lot of times when they would come out, like in this one, or Betty Boop, which you may recall, uh, people would make dolls uh, and other type of merchandising, and mugs and things like that, and try and sell them. And the companies would uh, obviously fight back uh, to keep them. So the Golden Age starts, 1938. First appearance of Superman. This book now has sold, not this particular copy, uh, has sold for $3.2 million, the most expensive comic. And as soon as he came out and was popular, other copies started to show up. So Wonder Man showed up a few months later. This company was in the same office building in New York City as DC, and it was a former DC employee who they said copy Superman, literally they basically told him copy Superman, uh, and 
back in the original Superman, he didn't fly. He, he just, so if you remember the television show with George Reeves, faster than a speeding bullet, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, because he didn't fly, he leaped. He, so and it didn't come till later that he, he actually started to fly. And so this comic book character appeared just once. If you notice the exhibit stamps on that copy, because that is the actual copy that was used in the copyright litigation against uh, Fox, or Brun's publication. Uh, they easily won an injunction, and as the judge said, short of Chinese copies, the defendant could hardly have gone further than it has done in copying Wonder Man from Superman. So they got a, a permanent injunction very easily, very quickly, and Wonder Man only showed up for that one issue. Now, um, a number of these books have showed up. The action, about 10 copies of action, like action one through 10, was used in the actual litigation to demonstrate to the judge, here's a comparison of the, cop of the characters. Uh, again, Michael Usland remembers seeing these in the closet when he did an inventory by Saul Harrison, who was an editor at the time, and then somehow they all disappeared. I own the top two copies now. Uh, the other two have been, some of the others have, have gone all over the place, so I, I have the second, action two is the second appearance of Superman inside. But again, he doesn't appear on the cover again until action seven. So they didn't quite know yet that that the comic book character had picked up. You know, so they kept the title, but the storylines had lots of other stories in it. It wasn't just Superman <coughs> until later in time. And understand, especially back at that time, I don't know what it's like now, the, the date on the covers are, are three months after what, when the comic book actually has come out. And so it took a bunch of time for them to find out what sales would be and see what a hit they have. And I, I learned that in a defamation case also, that the, the date on the covers doesn't mean when it actually came out. Magazines and, and, and comic books, they'd have an advanced date so that they could stay on the stands for two or three months so you wouldn't think you're buying something stale. Now, anybody have a sense of what the answer to this question is? Best-selling character, superhero character in the 40s. Superman would be a logical one. Right. Captain America? Captain America would be a good guess. It's not. It's Captain Marvel, published by Fawcett. So first appeared in 1940. So if you remember that first ash cans I showed you, the flash, that was the cover art that was used for Captain Marvel, and when he came out, I mean, we're talking a lot of money, half a million copies within the first year. Um, they were selling a million and a half copies every two weeks. I mean, think modern day comics, if they publish 100,000 copies of an issue, that's a lot. Most of them are about 40 to 60,000 copies of an issue. A million and a half every two weeks with, that they were selling. And they would make six cents a book, so $78,000 an issue. This is in the 1940s. Well, you know, you got to imagine DC's not happy about that. And so they sued in 1941. World War II intervened. The case pretty much languished. They didn't go to trial until 1948. And uh, by the way, DC owns Captain Marvel now uh, when Fawcett went out of business. So I guess they ultimately they really prevailed uh, in, in every sense of the word uh, because they own the character. But he is now called Shazam, if you remember the really bad television show from the early 70s, which I remember watching at the time and thought it was awesome. But if you watch it as an adult, disturbing. <laughs> Very disturbing show. He's called Shazam, as it says, Superman versus Shazam, because Fawcett let the copyright lapse because they didn't care anymore. And in 1968, Marvel Comics issued Captain Marvel, which is a completely different character. So by the time DC bought Captain Marvel from Fawcett, they had to switch it to Shazam. Shazam is the word that he says to become Captain Marvel from being Billy Batson. So they went to court in the Southern District of New York. And even though 
the judge said after going through a lengthy trial and a lot of experts and a lot of exhibits that it pretty much looks like Fawcett copied DC in creating Captain Marvel versus Superman. McClure Newspaper Syndicate, which was publishing the newspaper strip of Superman, inadvertently forgot to put some copyright designations in the strip. And the judge ruled on a technicality that they had forfeited protection for Superman. And that, so Fawcett won. Now, that obviously didn't sit too well with DC. Here are some of the exhibits that were actually used by DC. So DC submitted, the plaintiff, submitted these as exhibits in the trial to show that Captain Marvel was a copy knockoff of Superman. And these are all my copies. Uh, I own a whole bunch of them now. I find them wherever I can. Uh, obviously, one of a kind copies. And interestingly enough, so you see how nice condition that these are in, it's because these were in Fawcett's warehouse. So when Fawcett uh, sold itself in the 80s, it opened up its warehouse to comic dealers who could buy all of its inventory, and these were there. So they're in incredibly high grade condition. I lucked out and I found these on eBay of someone who was selling, I think, the special edition one, which is that's the first appearance of Captain Marvel. And you know, it's in obviously horrible shape. And then I contacted the seller. I'm like, do you have any others? And where did you get these? And it was just an intermediary seller who was selling them for someone else as an eBay store, basically. And he happened to have these other two. So I was able to buy all three of them. And that's the first Captain Marvel Adventures number one, which came out after this one. And it turns out, at least the story that he was told was, it was a guy who worked for Fawcett, and at some point in time, he took these home. So he obviously didn't take very good care of them. Uh, the Captain Marvel Adventures, I mean, that's in pieces. I had to like lay it on the book to take the photo or scan it. And fortunately, one of the big pieces that's, that is separate from the rest of the cover is the one that has the exhibit stamp on it. So I lucked out at least in that. So hey, they took it up on appeal to the Second Circuit, Judge Lam Learned Hand, which I'm sure you know of, uh, ruled, no, nah, you know what? I'm not allowing that technicality of McClure. Their intent was to maintain the copyright. Somebody screwed up in the art room. I'm not gonna allow that that is going to dictate that Superman is in the public domain. And it is so obvious that even though there are differences, Superman just disguises himself as Clark Kent. Captain Marvel is Billy Batson, who's a, a teenager, who turns into an adult. Um, Captain Marvel has a pet, has a tiger for a friend and a, a worm as an enemy. It's a much more campier comic. Not that Superman was necessarily serious, but it was really campy for the time. Maybe which is why it was doing so well in selling to some of the kids. But there was enough there that. The, the court ruled in favor. So they reversed and remanded. Fawcett, by 1954, comic books and superheroes are not as much in favor. So they decided to pull out of the comic book market altogether, and they settled for $400,000 and left. Now, more fun 101, 1945, came out during World War II. The cover doesn't indicate much of anything, but it's the first appearance of Superboy. And Superboy was created by Jerry Siegel, who, with Joe Schuster, was the creator of Superman as teenagers, high school students in Cleveland, buddies in, from high school. And Jerry Siegel was the writer, Joe Schuster was the artist. Siegel created Superboy in the late 1930s. He pitched it to DC, gave them a script, in fact. DC decided they didn't want to do it for whatever reason. And when Jerry was in World War II, Joe was 4F. He continued to stay working at DC. But Jerry went off, I and mean, he didn't fight uh, in any battles. You know, he was doing like the Hawaii military newspaper during the war. DC publishes Superboy. And he's furious, obviously, because they took his concept. So he files a lawsuit in 1947 in Superior Court in Westchester County. He gets Joe to join in with him, kind of pulling him along, because Joe didn't really want to do it. 
because uh, you were still working for DC at the time. And they sued for everything, Superman included. But the way the artists worked and the writers worked at that time was these were all work for hire. So Superman was sold to DC for $130. It was $10 a page. And there were 13 pages in the original story. And the check still exists. DC has it. Uh, Warner Brothers has it. it. has the original contracts. It's a huge wealth of a file, which I've had the luxury and liberty uh, privilege of going through. Uh, but they won on Superboy. So they ended up settling, and DC bought the rights, as it says, for $94,000. Now, Jerry Siegel was now blacklisted from DC. Uh, Joe continued on for a number of years, but uh, Jerry was pretty much out for, for the rest of his almost his lifetime um, until, as we know, if you know anything about copyright, you know, Congress in its infinite wisdom changes the copyright laws every so often and revives artist rights. So in the 60s that happened, Jerry Siegel went back to court, this time in federal court, and in these two decisions up above, they basically said, um, res judicata, you know, you already had your day in court, you, you, you lost or settled in the late 40s, and you're not going to get anything new. But then again, now both of them died in the 90s, Siegel and Schuster, but their heirs, once the laws changed again, where artists and creators could recapture rights, went back to court against Warner Brothers, and I, I don't even have all of the cases that are there. There's more than that. Ultimately, Warner Brothers won for the most part, and some of it came down to really specific arguments. What did Siegel and Schuster own? So Siegel only owned what was originally created in 1938. So Superman didn't fly. So anything to do with Superman flying, that was created by other people later on. Crypto the dog, they didn't create that. Other people at DC. Superman, the girlfriend, Lois Lane, uh, Super, uh, Lois Lane, Lana Lang, Supergirl, you know, these were all not necessarily created by Siegel and Schuster. Uh, and only, you know, little bit of details of the origin story. So they had to parse through in the litigation, what exactly do they own? And, and by the way, there had been payments when Superman the movie came out in 78 with uh, Christopher Reeve. There was an uproar by the community, the comic book artist community, to help give more money, pensions, to Siegel and Schuster. I mean, Joe Schuster was delivering messages in the streets of New York City, and Jerry Siegel was working as a, in a post office. And so DC was giving them like 20 grand a year for life. Uh, not, DC, no, not bad money back at that time, but there was this one lawyer in California who would find creators and their families and just bring lawsuits, lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. The lesson of this is don't mess with the mouse. <laughs> you never want to mess with Disney World. You do anything involving Disney World and they will come after you big time. And in fact, the copyright laws keep changing in large part because of Disney and some other companies because if you know anything about copyright, 75 years, I, I forget, 75 years, you know, the, the time, the life of the author, 40 years of this, whatever, they expire. You know, things fall into the public domain. I think, if I remember, I think Popeye now is in the public domain. At least, and it differs from country to country. You could be protected here in the U.S., but not protected in Europe, or vice versa. So this was an underground parody in the early 70s, which actually the guy who did it did it deliberately to taunt Disney, and it worked, because Disney came and destroyed this guy, uh, and, and went after him for it. So there were only two issues of Air Pirates funds that, that came out. And there's been a lot of other litigation, again, mostly copyright, and some attempts by authors to recapture the rights of those characters from years and years past. Sometimes disputes between the artists as well. Now, let's see what we got on time. All right, I'll just kind of go through some of this. So in the late 40s, early 50s, <coughs> Frederick Wortham launched this crusade about how 
dangerous comic books were for the youth of the day. He was actually a very renowned psychiatrist, German emigre, uh, down in New York City area, and he would study juvenile delinquency. He wrote a lot about it, and when he would go to the juvenile delinquents' homes, he always noted, and this is in the 40s, mid to late 40s, he always noticed that all these young boys, mostly boys I'm sure, were sitting around and reading comic books. Comic books, juvenile delinquents, they're reading the comic books, so comic books create juvenile delinquents. Forget about the other million kids who were reading the comic books and who weren't juvenile delinquents. Didn't matter. But there, he, he launched into this crusade. And any magazine of the day, Reader's Digest, Collier's Life, there will be articles about uh, that he wrote the horrors of comics and what it was doing to the youth. Right? So here's one of these things. There's a lot about Batman and Robin perhaps having a somewhat unhealthy relationship or illegal relationship because Robin was underage. Uh, not actually unhealthy, illegal, uh, because he was, the, he was his ward at the time. Uh, so this was some of the stuff that he would say. Right? Now, enter Max Gaines, who is, I mentioned the Gaines before, who helped start the industry of comics. This is his son. Um, the, the senior Gaines died in a boating accident in the late 40s. Max Gaines took over and created Mad Magazine, uh, as we know it. And he loved fighting with Wortham, as you can see right there. But it spilled over into Congress. And anytime Congress is going to get involved to try and mandate morality is not necessarily a good thing. And there were all sorts of hearings. And in fact, there was this one hearing where Gaines testified. Now, Gaines had, as many of them did at that time, let's say, use of substances. And he stayed up all night long uh, popping pills so that he could work on his testimony. So he wasn't at his best when he appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And all the other comic book publishers that were there were sort of like you know, sitting over here as everything focused on Bill Gaines. And EC, which was the company, would publish comics like this in the early 50s. Very popular. You know, a little bit disturbing even today, right? And there was this discourse between the general counsel of the committee and Gaines asking, okay, so, you know, are you publishing things with good taste? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, so here's your comic book. I is this in good taste? And Gaines said, yes, absolutely, because look, we're showing there's no blood dripping from her head. You know, we could have we could have had it coming a little bit, you know, higher and everything. So, yeah, this is totally in good taste. So, needless to say, his testimony didn't go over very well. <laughs> The ACLU jumped in trying to save, you know, from a censorship standpoint, obviously. But the comic book community was really nervous. And they were really concerned that Congress was going to enact laws that were going to mandate what they could and could not publish. So, just like the movie industry would years later, they created their own code. So they were going to police themselves. And so, in the 1950s, here would be what comic books would now be allowed to publish, right? So you couldn't use horror or terror as an example. No more Walking Dead and torture and vampires and werewolfism. They're all prohibited, which was a problem because DC Comics had a guy named Marv Wolfman who worked for them. And every time he would put his name to the comic, they would censor it. Because he's like, it's my name, <laughs> all right? And no, oh sorry, females had to be drawn realistically without exaggeration of physical qualities because there are what called headlight comics. I'll let you figure out what that means. <laughs> that were very popular in the 40s and 50s. Again, mostly eight year old to 15 year old boys buying the comic books. Now it had a significant impact. Most of the comic book companies went out of business as a result of this. And this was in large part why also Fawcett decided in 1954 to, to get out uh, because the code went into effect. So 
you know, really dramatic impact. Now, Gaines was to hell with you. He turned Mad, which was a comic book, into a magazine format. Magazines were not subject to the comic book code. And there are a number of issues where he would just lambast the comic book companies. So there's a lot of times where he'd make fun of superheroes and, and the code, and that's because they basically ran him out of the hobby. And there would be guides that would be issued. At, by the way, lawyers were running the comic book code. No surprise there. Uh, this was from 1974, I think. Yeah, 20 years of regulation. But like everything, society changes. Our tastes change. Political correct correctness changes. What was horrific back in the 50s, by the late 60s, early 70s, nobody really cared about anymore. So you started to see things creep back in into the comic book world. And some characters that, you know, Ghost Rider, obviously a, a movie by, with Nicolas Cage about a decade ago. And they started to change some of the ratings. So Marvel was the first one to come out with its own internal rating system. Everybody started to forget the code. The code does not exist any longer at all. I mean, it's ridiculous, you know, if you see what is published now. And again, the audience is completely different. So Marvel took a shot at the code, again with She-Hulk the lawyer, as she's wearing the code as her costume or her clothing there. And, but not everybody followed the code. So Dell Comics, first of all, if you followed the code, you had to pay money into the code per title that you issued because you had to pay for the staff. Dell's like, we publish a ton of comics. Right? All these characters, most of whom you probably recognize. It's going to bankrupt us if we pay. And why should we pay? Because all our comics are wholesome. There's nothing in it. Right? Mothers can relax too when children read Del Con. I love the dog looking at <laughs> his master as he reads comic books. Uh, so Dell refused to join the code and nobody did anything. But I always, I always love the fact that this is 1954. I have this hanging in my, my house. It's about yay big. It was like in Life magazine or something. Thirteen years earlier, Dell published that cover, <laughs> which I think, from as far as we know, was an inker error. Because if you look inside, he's wearing yellow shorts. But I think they just forgot to ink the cover. So, I bought this at a San Diego Comic Con about a decade ago. One of the dealers. He's like, Mark, you got to come over here. I have a book I know you're going to want. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, I have to have this book. This is just too funny. Phantasma. Um, so that is, that is the impact of comic books and lawyers and law and, and the judges uh, that we have.